The Your Safe Space podcast is recorded on Wurundjeri land. This podcast acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of the land. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to Your Safe Space, the podcast. I'm your host, Adele Marie, and this podcast is here for you. It is a safe space for us to catch up each week to discuss anything and everything. And on today's show, we are doing another AMA on air or an Ask Me Anything on air. Happy Friday to my favorite people in the world and happy weekend. We have made it. Thank goodness. I don't know why I'm saying thank goodness because we had a short week. (laughs) It was Easter and we obviously had a public holiday on Monday. And I hope that you guys had a lovely one. If you celebrated, obviously, happy Easter again. Mine was very low key in some areas. Obviously, I did also go to Adelaide and I'll talk to you about that in the Sunday show. But we had my mum's Easter because I always celebrate like the normal Easter. And then we also have the Orthodox Easter this coming weekend because my dad is Greek. He's Orthodox. We've always celebrated both. My family is not super religious, but we have always just done both. So I feel like I've got round two this weekend. So happy Easter again, if you are also Orthodox or celebrating. And I hope that if you didn't celebrate, you still had a good time. If you worked, I hope that you got paid lots with the public holiday rates. And yeah, I hope you guys are doing something nice and relaxing this weekend as well. If you happen to be new here and you're clicking on this podcast episode for the first time in your life, these Friday episodes are actually my favorite. They are our short, sharp, juicy ones where you guys submit your questions every Monday night on my personal Instagram. I put up a question box. We call it AMA and I give you my hot take. (laughs) Now, these episodes are not a substitute for therapy or professional mental health support. It's just my hot take. It's just some big sis advice. It's just like a bit of mentoring, if you will. And I love them because I've got lots of thoughts on lots of things and we don't waste any time. So we're going to jump into question number one, which is what do I do if I feel like my boyfriend is not the one for me? I'm so confused. Thank you to this listener for sending this over. I obviously don't have a lot of context with this question, but when you have these thoughts, I understand how confusing it can be. It's a gray area. And what I mean by that is There's no way for me to sit here and tell you that your boyfriend is or isn't the one. I don't know the answer to that and I can't tell you that. And relationships are deeply complex. They're deeply layered. There are issues and there are often lots of seasons that a relationship can go through as well. And I believe that we can never be certain about something like this. We can never be certain about potential outcomes of a path not taken And we can never be certain about making a decision. And I'm talking about you potentially ending this relationship because you think that he's not the one. Whatever decision you are to make in this circumstance would be the one that you would live with. And you won't ever know for 100% certainty how the opposite choice would have turned out. And you know how I always talk about when you guys ask me, how do I know if I'm making the right decision? And I always say, you will never know that you're making the right decision. The right decision isn't ever really a thing. It's like, I guess, markers in place or have some insight in place where you can make an educated decision or you can make an educated choice or you can collect the data that you need to collect and then make the call for it on yourself. And so what I recommend to this listener is grabbing your journal, go get it or grab a piece of paper and write this out because it's important that you do. I have some questions that you need to ask yourself. (laughs) The first thing that you need to ask yourself is what is making you feel like he is not the one? Where is that coming from? What is causing that? So I want you to write down, I think he's not the one because write it down and then ask yourself again why he is not the one or what is making you think that way. The reason that I say to ask yourself again is because you're going to ask yourself about three to five times. And the reason I do that is because sometimes we have to ask over and over and over until we get to the core of whatever the issue actually is. I say this because I've done it in the past. You have to dig a little bit deeper to get to the root of the problem, to shine light on that area. And I feel like by doing this, you can figure out if this is something that you can work through and it is a relationship that can be saved, or is it something more serious where your values are clashing and it's not something that is salvageable. It's important that when you do this step that you are really honest and 
there are, I think in any relationship, some really solid signs that the relationship is not right for you or is unhealthy for you or it has run its course. And I always think to myself, especially if I've had to do this in the past, is would I want my best friend in a relationship like this? Would I want my potential future daughter in a relationship like this? And that can help me be really honest with myself and be really honest while I'm doing this question. The next thing or the second tip is I want you to write down the good things in the relationship and the things that stop you from wanting to end it. I always say I'm about balance. I'm not just about focusing on one side. We're going to look at both sides and I want you to write these down too. This is to bring awareness and kind of create a bigger whole picture of the scenario. Thirdly, I want you to then look at other areas of your life and think of it as like doing a little stock take. Look at work, look at your career, your family, your friends, your fun, your self-care. How are those areas looking? How are you feeling in each of those areas? I ask this because sometimes, and I've had this in the past as well, if work is going really bad or like your friendships are going really bad or you're not doing your self-care, sometimes our relationship can take the brunt of it as well. And sometimes we can then put pressure on the relationship because other areas are causing that. So have a look at that. And then lastly, I want you to write down everything that scares you about leaving the relationship. Often we have fear about leaving a relationship, even when we know we want to, because the short-term discomfort of actually ending it keeps us stuck. And that fear can be really powerful. And that fear is actually really real, but it is a short-term discomfort. And the immediate fear of the negative consequences of actually breaking up with your partner, these are temporary. Sometimes you might actually be better off in the long term, even if it doesn't really feel like that. But I want you to write it down so you can give it some air, give it some space, and you can take a holistic view of the relationship and where you are at. And after doing that, hopefully you have some more clarity on the circumstances. I would love to do an episode, and I'll put this in the polls, but I want to do an episode on like how to know a relationship has run its course. This question is about the one, and I've got one more point that I want to make on it, but I didn't go into that because that's not what this listener asked, but I would love to. So keep an eye out on that in the polls. But my last note on the one, and this might throw a spanner in the works, <laughs> but the one or the concept of the one has been studied and I have some science-based facts. Now, this way of thinking where we believe that we have the one is known as a destiny relationship mindset. It involves the belief that there is one true love for each of us and that we have a particular image of what that partner should look like or what that relationship should look like. The research suggests that people who hold a destiny relationship mindset tend to accept things the way that they are. Their relationship is either viewed as perfect because it fits within what they believe they are looking for or the relationship falls short of what their ideal is and so it is not the one. There are consequences to having this mindset and people who resonate with this may actually tend to work less at their relationships. They may struggle to deal with relationship setbacks. So maybe that's arguments or things that need work. And you also might be dissatisfied if your partner or the relationship changes in a way that deviates from this idea or this soulmate-like idea that you have about them. Now, I've spoken about this before. I don't believe in the one. You guys know that. And I think people who have found the one, who think they believe in the one, have just found a really healthy relationship and have just found a relationship that both people have put in the effort, both people have worked at. And I truly believe if both partners are willing, even in this listener's circumstance, if she's willing or he's willing or they are both willing, they could potentially work to become the one so hopefully if they do this exercise, it can give some clarity and you can see if there are some signs that this is not the relationship for you or maybe it's something else at play or maybe the relationship just actually needs some work. Good luck and let me know what you guys think. I would love to know if you believe in the one or not. All right, next question. How do I stop overthinking even the most simple things? How do I just let go of my worries and enjoy life? Oh, guys, I haven't had an overthinking question in a little while, but as a huge overthinker myself, I'll put my hand up and call myself out on that. I can relate to this. I have always been a, let me think of the worst case scenario. 
I don't think I'm as bad now because I have implemented some stuff and I'm going to give you my tips. But before I get into it, the other thing I want to say is that everyone overthinks sometimes, okay? It's not a bad thing to overthink. Like most of the stuff we talk about, it exists on a scale. And if you overthink here and there, not that frequently, that's okay. These tips might actually help you. But if you are overthinking to the point where it impacts your ability to like function and live and get through the day, I would actually suggest chatting to your GP because they might be able to help you with next steps or navigating that. For now though, here are my tips. And these are three tips that I've got when you are in the moment for overthinking. So this is like tackling it head on. The first tip is awareness. So this is always my starting point. I think you guys have figured that out by now. Overthinking can often become such a habit that we do it without even realizing that we do it. And when I notice myself doing it, I like to just say, oh, (laughs) I'm doing it. I'm overthinking. I just take note and I become aware that that's what is happening. The next tip is to troubleshoot. And this is a tactic that my psychologist taught me. If I'm overthinking about something that I have control over, I think of a solution or I think of worst case scenario and I think about how I will deal with that outcome. If I don't have control in the situation, I then need to think about the way I would cope with the outcome. And this, what it does for me when I do think about this is actually bring me calmness because I realize that worst case scenario is actually not that bad. And I'm overthinking worse in my head than what is actually happening in reality. And sometimes I will write this down sometimes, or now I can tend to just like think about it and I can do this without writing it down. But if you are struggling with it and you haven't done it before, write it down, write down your worst case scenario, write down how you would handle it. Focus on what you can control though. And then my last tip is to challenge the thoughts. So once you are in the overthinking pattern and you guys, if you experience it, you can definitely get carried away, (laughs) right? Your emotions are really heightened. Your emotions are running wild. Your mind is running wild. And this is where I like to stick to facts and kind of like rein it in. And I ask myself two things. Again, shout out to my psychologist. But I ask, what evidence do I have that this thought is true? That's the first question. And then I ask, what evidence do I have that my thought isn't true? And just by doing that, I can see, okay, some things are legit here. Some things are made up in my imagination. And I've also then got two other tips just in general for your day-to-day life, which I think would actually help with the overthinking. And these are firstly to practice mindfulness. The reason that I believe I am better at it now is because I do practice mindfulness. And there are so many mindful activities that exist and so many mindful activities that you could do. Gardening, walking, breathing activities. It could even just be staying off your phone while you eat your lunch or eat your breakfast. It could even be practicing mindfulness while you're brushing your teeth in the morning. It can be so simple. My personal favorite things in relation to this are journaling. You guys know. Gratitude, practicing that. And the gym, because I realize this. When I'm in the gym, it's like my hour of me time. No one's annoying me. No one's texting me. Yes, sometimes I might be filming content, but I'm in the zone. It's my one hour out of the day when no one's bothering me. And that is me being mindful and me being present. Obviously, I've also told you guys that I will record some meditations coming up hopefully next month for you. And you could even start out trialing with those. There will be obviously meditations, but there are lots of different things that you can do and lots of different activities that you can practice with. Over time, if you start to do this, you'll actually see it will decrease your overthinking and help you stay in the here and now. And that leads me to my second tip on this, which is just practice with it overthinking is not something that you can just solve or get rid of overnight, especially if you've been doing it your entire life up until this point. Give yourself that grace, give yourself that time and allow yourself to make that conscious effort and know that with time you will get better at it. It's like a skill. It's like a muscle. The more you work it, the stronger it gets. I will say this could also be another episode on its own. So I will add it to the poll soon in the Facebook group. So come in there and obviously vote for the next episodes, but let us know your favorite mindful activities. I love to hear what everyone else is doing. As I said, there's so many that exist out there and we would love to know what yours are. On to question number three. When should you plan the second date? We are both super keen, but I don't want to seem pushy. 
And you guys know I love a dating question. Congratulations to this listener for a successful first date. We love to hear it. I know how hard the dating field can be. I know how hard the dating scene is. And I'm really proud of you for putting yourself out there, having a good first date and having the possibility of a second date. Now, as for this, I don't think there are any rules. I also don't like playing games. And you guys would probably know by listening to this podcast, I wear my heart on my sleeve and I'm the kind of person that will tell someone that like, I'm excited for the date. I will double text them and I will tell them I'm keen for the second date while I'm on the bloody first date. Like I don't really have any chill about me (laughs) when it comes to this. And maybe it's not working for me because I am single, but I really don't want to give you like rules or timelines on this. Personally, what I like to do when I'm dating is if I've had a good first date, I will want to have a second date as close as I can to the first date. In an ideal world for me, when I'm dating somebody, I like to see them maybe once or twice a week. Again, it's fine if it's less or more for you. It's fine if you have your own way of dating or your own rules. I'm just giving you like a loose guide, again, on what I personally like. But for this listener, I would just say, be really honest and tell them. Shoot them a message and say, hey, I really liked our first date and I would be keen for another. I'm free on Thursday night. What are you doing? Let's do something. Obviously, I know that's very forward. (laughs) And so if that's too forward, then you could say, hey, I had a really good first date and I'm looking forward to the next. And that way you can just insinuate that you're open to the next date without saying it's Thursday. I want it at Thursday, 7 p.m. This is what I want. That's how you can do it without being too forward. I personally like being forward. I think you guys know I value communication and I think it's really attractive when a man does that to me. Like I love when a man is so forward with me and doesn't let me think that like, oh, is he confused about me or is he into me? Like I love when they're just forward and to the point. And so I think that's why I match that energy in return or why I value that and why I then do that. Obviously, I also have an Aries sun and an Aries Venus. So maybe that's why (laughs) I do that. But please go and get your second date and please let us know how it goes. I hope that you have a great second date. You may have already had the second date by now because I think you asked this question last week, but hopefully there's a third date on the cards for you as well. And lastly, we have question number four. What do you think about traveling with a partner? Have you gone overseas with a boyfriend? I love this question and it is very niche, but I wanted to put it in because traveling with your partner is the ultimate test and something I am all for. And I have gone overseas with two of my exes, both of them. We went to Bali, my Sydney ex, and then the ex that I had before him, we both went to Bali. That's so weird that we were going to the same place. Anyway, I'll tell you a nightmare story at the end. And it's so funny. We can laugh about it now, but it was not, it was not a fun time while I was in it. But here is why I think it's a vibe. And if you're thinking about going on a holiday with your partner, why I think you should do it. The first one is that you will make great memories with them. You'll have fun. And I think traveling is amazing anyway, even better when you get to share it with somebody that you love and you get to look back on these amazing memories together forever. You also have really good holiday sex and I don't know why that is, but it just is. And maybe it's because you are away from life and work and routine, but I think it can add some spark back into the relationship too. Secondly, it pushes you both outside your comfort zone. And I'm really big on this because I think travel is a whole new environment. You're out of your routine. You're away from everything familiar. Again, it's great if you want to do it solo, but even better when you are in a relationship because you will be able to take that next step together. And if you are obviously into comfort zones, please listen to Sunday's episode. We do a deeper dive on this. And obviously that's on a more personal level, but getting out of your comfort zone is such a beautiful thing and an amazing thing to do. And I think if you can do that with your partner while you're traveling, that's a great way to take that relationship to the next level. And then thirdly, it deepens the relationship. So it pushes you into that next chapter. And you learn so much about you. You learn so much about your partner. Obviously, being away together, you have a lot more time to focus on each other. You have a lot more time to focus on the relationship. And you have time for things that you may not have time for in your day-to-day life. Things like fun, relaxation, 
Maybe it's a chance for you to work on building your trust together, building your communication. You'll also learn about compromise while you're traveling. You can learn how your partner handles stress. I think when you're traveling, you run the risk of like getting lost, maybe missing a flight, maybe getting sick, maybe even having something stolen. Hopefully not. Hopefully we all have safe travels. But all of these things can show you how your partner will show up in this circumstance and it can potentially give you a little foresight into the future. Obviously, there is the other side of it where some relationships don't survive a holiday. Some couples don't come back from the holiday together. When I went away with both of my exes, it was a good thing for us. And I think travel is a harsh teller of the truth. And I think it should be something that you do do, especially if you are like thinking that you want to move out with your partner or you want to live with your partner. Traveling on a holiday is a good way to kind of test the waters and see how you would go. It will give you a chance to see your partner at their best and also at their worst. And it will also give you a chance to learn a lot about you and for your partner to also do the same with you. Now, I don't have time for tips in this show, but if you do want tips while traveling with your partner in another AMA app, please ask it in the coming weeks. I will add it to the list. But let me quickly tell you my horror story. Um, As always, I'm going to change the name of my ex. We're going to call him Dave. Um, (laughs) Anyway, we had gone to Bali for, why did we go for Bali? Just for a holiday. And this was like a long, long time ago. I was with him when I was like 22, 23, maybe even 24. So it was a while ago. And we were in Bali. We had gone to the main part of Bali and then I believe we were in Seminyak and then we went to an island. What island did we go to? I think it was Gili T. No, I'm not, not I think. It was Gili T. And so we get to Gili T and I remember that first night we went out. We had a like late lunch, some cocktails on the beach. And Gili T, if you haven't been to Gili T, is a beautiful little island. There are like no cars there. It's just like donkeys and carts and bikes And it's very small. It takes you like 20 minutes to go around the whole island. It's a beautiful, beautiful part of Bali. I love Bali and I would would like to go back, but not the point of this story. So anyway, I ate this meal and then we go back to the villa that we're staying at and I'm in the pool and I order some pineapple because I just felt like eating fresh pineapple. (laughs) I can't believe I'm telling this story. And so I eat this pineapple and within, I'm talking like, I don't know, a couple of hours from eating the pineapple, I start to feel violently ill to the point where I'm like violently sick from like both ends in the bathroom in this villa with Dave in the next room. Babe, are you okay? Are you all right? Well, I'm literally dying and fighting for my life. Now, this man saw me at my absolute worst. I was crying (laughs) because I was so unwell. And if you have been to Bali and ever gotten sick, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I was thinking to myself, I just want my mum. Like, I just want to go back home. Like, I can't do this. I couldn't stop either end of the situation, guys. It was fucked. And he was coming in there trying to, like, help me. And I'm crying, being like, get away from me. Like, this is so fucked up. And we didn't end up breaking up after that, guys. I thought that that was going to be, like, nail in the coffin. This man is is never going to find me attractive again. But the relationship didn't survive. It did survive that. It didn't survive in the long run. But that is one of my travel horror stories with an ex-boyfriend. And it to this day makes me feel ill when I think about it. But it's just proof that traveling can sometimes be a good thing for the relationship. Really test it, really push you out of your comfort zone, really take it to that next level and really show you the best and worst in it. But I think we can wrap the show there on that very foul note. I'm so sorry if you were eating something. I hope that you weren't. But as always, if you are not already, please follow us on Instagram. It's Your Safe Space Pod. Follow me at Adele Marie and join our beautiful Facebook group. We have over 4,000 people in there now. And just quietly, if you are in the group, you guys are my favorite people. So if you're not in there, come and join it so you can also be my favorite people. And please leave us a review on Apple, a rating on Spotify, and also tag us in your story while you're listening to the show. It goes a long way. Thank you so much. I will see you on Sunday for the episode on comfort zones. And I hope you enjoy. Bye, guys.